Hello, and welcome to Folio Magazine. I'm Rob Nicholson. Today, my guest is multi-award winning, uh, nominated for producer of the year, uh, you name it. She's done it in the music industry. There was a time where you could not turn on a radio or television and not hear her coming through it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paula Cole. Paula, welcome. Hi, Rob. Hi, everybody. It's lovely it to so, be here. Thank you. It is so nice to talk to you again. We've met several times, and it's a, and we're thrilled to have you back in Northeast Florida. Here we are, still enduring the mu- the music business <laughs> after all these years, Rob. Right? Uh, well, and it, t- trust me, there's been moments where I've said, you know what? <laughs> but, <laughs> I know. But we, we always me too. <laughs> we, we, we all get sucked back in. Paula, I wanted to remind people, and if you could give us an idea of what it was like to for Peter Gabriel to leave a phone message for you, and suddenly you're touring the world with him. What was that like? Oh gosh, he was my hero. I, I loved, I loved his music so much, and I and I literally would play his So album in my walk, my Sony Walkman. You know, it was a cassette Sony Walkman, and I would. On the A side, I had recorded So, and on the B side, I had recorded Aretha's Gold. And I would literally walk all around Boston because I was a student at, the, at this time. And just I just knew every song inside and out. And I had a particular affinity for Don't Give Up, which I found out from Peter that he wanted Dolly Parton to originally sing that female part. And she said no. So he got Kate Bush. Of course, you know, that's so stunning her her performance i just loved the song and i felt some kind of spiritual connection to it that i can't even describe and i like i said i was such a dear fan also of the band that it was astonishing and wonderful and i was determined to step in to be a fellow co-pilot like when you're a band on tour you want all pilots You don't want any passengers. So I was just determined to be my best and know the the songs inside and out so that if somebody took another vocal part, I'd hop to a different one and and so on and so forth. And it was exhilarating. And I had to be that ready because we didn't even have a proper rehearsal. It was just a sound check and we ran a couple of songs and then I was thrown onto those moving parts of the Secret World Live stages. There were two stages and a walkway. And we recorded and uh, filmed just a, literally just a few days after that in Modena, Italy. So it was sink or swim. I was ready. I loved the music. I was young. Um, you know, I was 25 and beautiful and in my power. And and it was my first tour. And uh, that's crazy that, you know, five star everything and first class everything and thousands and thousands of people in the audience that's your first tour but that's the way it was so it was very abrupt a very steep incline and I just had to be ready and adaptable and deft and I was so I I joined that tour and I was ready for it and then I've come home to America and after I don't know half a year of touring with Peter my my own album finally came out because he had heard my album Harbinger my first album my debut It's called Harbinger. And he had heard it. And that's why he asked me to join, um, which was so fortunate. So it was time for Harbinger to finally come out in the States. I would fly home from gigs with Peter and I rented um, a Cadillac and I would drive around the country with my boyfriend, a guitar player, Jerry Leonard. We would drive city to city and show up at coffee houses and set up a PA because The Cadillac was the only car that had the boot of the trunk, you know, where the PA was safe and where it could actually fit. So we would rent a Cadillac and drive off (laughs) the States. And I'd play for like five people in a coffee house. And then I'd fly to Europe and, you know, sing for 15 or 50,000. Or we closed Woodstock in 94 uh, with Peter. That was a quarter of a million people. And, you know, helicoptered in and out. It was just, it was a very quick transition into the music business. And it's just, you need to be adaptable, you know. You really did. that. I mean, that is an amazing story, Paula. I'm surprised it hadn't come out in a book yet. I know that we're both fans of um, Kate Bush, and that must have really been incredible to uh, 
to sing that song with Peter. I I, I can't even. I got goosebumps while you were talking about it. So, I, what? Oh. How, how thrilling was the beginning of your career? That was very thrilling, and and I, I must say that Kate Bush is a, is a huge influence to me. She was among the artists I thanked when I won my Grammy. You know, I I just love her. She gave me and a lot of other artists freedom because she was so brave and eccentric even in pushing the envelope and making the music the way she wanted it to be without kind of being in that very typical system, that very typical patronizing kind of male dominated system where the male producer would take the young female and give them his sound. It's almost like you're behind glass and the glass is the producer's sound in a sense, but rather like teach her how to fish. Like, we need young women to learn how to fish so that they are creating their own music and they're inspired to self-produce and craft their own sound for their music and be responsible for the whole of it. So she was one of the rare few women in the music business who was self-producing at the time, which was radical. So I would like turn over her CDs or LPs or cassettes and it would say produced by Kate. And it makes sense because it didn't sound like anything else. It didn't sound like any of the producers. So I was very profoundly influenced by Kate Bush. I just, I adore her. I adore her. I adore her. I, I share her music with my students today. I think it's important that we acknowledge her. I'm thrilled for her that uh, Running Up That Hill became a huge hit from Stranger Things. But what man, I've been... What, what? I've been drinking the Kool-Aid for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and what that was wonderful how that happened. 30 years later, a whole no, new generation discovers her because I like you, and I've never heard her so beautifully described as you just did. So thank you for that. That was wonderful. Oh, of course. Thank you, Rob. Sure. Now you're you're touring now um with Sophie B. Hawkins. Yes, we have a bunch of concerts together. It's been wonderful to uh share the evening with Sophie. Like She's she has a streak of eccentricity, which I love, and she's just incredibly talented. She's kind of raw power, like she has a Robert Plant thing to her voice. Yeah. Uh and she's a great dynamic performer physically, too. Like just the way she dances and moves on the stage. She's a beautiful songwriter. I think she's very underappreciated as uh, as an artist and and songwriter. Really beautiful work. And, and, and um, uh, the, you're doing a show here uh, in uh, ja near Jacksonville. It's uh, at the Thrasher Horn Center. Um, uh, that's coming up on November the 20th. We're going to put some music around uh, this uh, interview with Paula. I, one of the people that you were one time with, and I, I, I hooked up with both of you in uh, St. Louis, was Sarah McLaughlin. And you were a big part of the Lil Affair. Oh, yes. I was um, opening for Sarah in 1995. I was on my Harbinger album supporting that. And Sarah was supporting her Fumbling Towards Ecstasy album. So in 95, I was opening for the Fumbling Towards Ecstasy tour all over the States. And we really just got on great, Sarah and I. We loved each other. And so she just kept having me open. And I knew at the time it was extraordinary. There just weren't very many women opening for women right. uh, that was the general rule basically radio stations shouldn't play two women back to back radio stations shouldn't play two women within an hour sometimes or even within a day like some of the older women in radio i speak to um they they were told you can only play one woman a day like on country so and they are now um uh, at places like wmot outside of nashville they are they are still fighting the good fight they have the highest heaviest headwinds against them and they've made the path easier for the rest of us and i have i've definitely had headwinds you know as in the music business as a female and i work hard and i give it my best and i hope that it's better for people behind me you know um so sarah and i knew the struggles we were up against we loved each other's company the music was compatible so every night in the opening set, I would tell the audience, it's rare for two women to open for one, you know, a woman to open for the other. I want to thank Sarah McLaughlin for having me here. And the audience would erupt 
into applause. There was a zeitgeist because they knew it was true. And we got a sense of, oh my goodness, there's something powerful here. So we then had pilot concerts where it, it was like the lead up to Lilith. So I, I was there in the whole formation and the ideation of it. It was fantastic. The pilots went successfully. Um, and then Lilith Fair started at the Gorge in Washington State in 1997. We had our first Lilith. It was a sellout. And uh, it's interesting to see Brandy Carlisle now is kind of like picking up that Lilith torch, you know, and championing other women and helping other women. It was a it it was the movement. It felt like we were changing culture, and I was just very proud to be part of it. You, you were y'all were both at the forefront of it, and I you know I I, I did dr- uh, drop away from uh, the music business in 2010, and that was the last time. I talked to Sarah and uh, I always consider her a dear friend. So I hope you'll tell her hello the next time that you talk to her. Oh, absolutely. I love her. Paula, it has been a delight catching up with you today. I can't wait to see you coming up on the 20th at Thrasher Horn. Um, and so uh, I know you're uh, actually on your way. Thank you for taking the time. She, if Paula's on her way to uh, New York City to hang out with her husband for his birthday, which is, sounds like a ton of fun. So have a great time. Tonight. Oh, yes. Have a and great- I want to say thank you. And I want to say that the Thrasher Horn Center is going to be our last show of 2022. So it'll be very special to me. And it's going to be a great show. So come on out. I, I did not realize that. That That's <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, well, we, you guys have a good time tonight. And we will see you on the 20th Portfolio Magazine. I'm Rob Nicholson.